What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? It's the one and only Dalt Waters, James Williams of the Dalt Waters Network, and I'm back with another phenomenal interview. Now, guys, I don't know if you guys know what's coming down the pipeline. Are you? In fact, you already know because we did the Dog Man Werewolf Weekend by now, and now we're rolling into our weekend where we talk about Bigfoot and Sasquatch and all those type of things. And I got something special for you tonight. I got something special, really, really special for you. Um, most of the times when we talk about Bigfoot and and Sasquatch and the Yeti, we talk to investigators, right? People who say they've been out in the woods, or we talk to people who've had eyewitness encounters. We had some phenomenal eyewitness encounters come on here. But tonight, we are talking to Peter Von Putcamera. He is a director, a producer, and he's had TV shows on. He's had plenty of shows on TV, been extremely successful. And I'm excited about having a conversation with him and kind of helping him swim and navigate through the dark waters then diving a little bit deep trying to drown him in the dark waters then pulling him back up reviving him then taking him back down and trying to drown him again uh so we're gonna have some fun tonight ladies and gentlemen peter how are you doing this evening i'm doing great thanks thanks for having me i'm i'm happy to have you on buddy i really am let's start here let's uh uh when i normally interview people and this is a little bit different i talk about their passions and where their passion started but like i was saying in a pre-interview i just know it i got this feeling that everything with you as far as it pertains to movies and television and cameras i just feel like it started when you were a kid talk to me about your childhood and how you got into just the concept of being a director and a film producer because it has to start at an early age in order for you to have the kind of success that you've had right yep you're very intuitive about that you are correct um, I did start very young. Um, look, my interest in probably like the fields that I work in, you know, like paranormal cryptozoology, but also wildlife adventure and uh, indigenous peoples, right? Um, so when I was a kid, um, my dad uh, started a, a resort, a horse ranch north of Vancouver, Canada. And it was really early on that no one was doing anything like that. And um, uh, I ended up meeting a lot of, you know, Native Americans or Native Canadians at that time. And this is early days in the 60s. And nobody, you know, there wasn't the interest there, there is now. It was just, you know, cowboys and Indians on TV. And um, they really... Uh, loved working with my dad and they it was like they call it aboriginal tourism now but he really introduced people in the area to the cultures of the native people and I grew up in that setting I had a, like a shaman a medicine man who would talk to me when I was five or six years old and he was telling me about bears and what they like to eat and medicine uh, it's traditional stuff and I got really fascinated and later on in life I ended up working after I did a film degree at university. Yes, you're right. I did super eight films in high school. I took photographs. I started having photo shows when I was like 18. Um, and in high and then in, in university I did a degree in film. Um, but and I got a summer job working with the government and what we did is go out to native Indian communities and make videos with the communities. So that kind of snowballed into uh, I got really successful at that. I worked with native filmmakers here in America as well. And we produce shows for PBS and things that were really influential, like, you know, working in the areas of drug and alcohol prevention, things like that, but also getting into their cultures and sacred ceremonies and masks. And it was in the mask ceremonies that I started to see the Sasquatch in the Pacific Northwest, uh, as well as other creatures that are real and some that, you know, are fabled or whatever. And that's, I guess, my first interest in Bigfoot in that was through my introduction to Native people from an early age. That's cool, man. That's cool. I um, it, it, You'll be amazed that when, when I ask that question, how many people take their passions back to their childhood and it's a beautiful thing when a man or a woman can trace the lineage of their passion back to their childhood because you can see the results of someone starting to perfect the craft at an early age um 
you see these I mean these overreaching huge phenomenal results they have in their life compared to someone who just took a casual interest in their 20s um, the people who start off young they are extremely successful and that's one of the things that's why I like to ask that question because they're it's super yeah. successful um, let's go into and first of all ladies and gentlemen if you're listening I want you to take this from what Peter said and what I'm saying right now because there's a lot of parents that listen you got kids if your kid has a passion and they're young and you know kids switch up every now and then oh I want to play football oh I want to be in I want to be a, a director oh I want to be an engineer just nurture those passions because when we as parents discourage those passions then we put out flames that we never know what it'll turn out to turn out to be you know what I'm saying if, if Peter's parents would have said oh hell no you're not going to be a film producer then he probably would have never got to where he is today and he's done phenomenal things all right let me touch on something you just said and I want to just dig a little bit deeper so I'm pulling out my shovel not gonna dig too deep um all right. so you said you saw the first time you saw the Sasquatches were when you were watching the mass ceremonies. You mean as in you saw the masks themselves with yes. those faces on it, right? Okay. Just one Yeah, well one. it's 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 more than that really. The um I was in a place called Alert Bay, BC, and there um, you know, like here you guys have probably heard about, you know, some of the stuff that Native Americans went through and the ceremonies were banned at one point and they got put into missionary schools and there was a lot of dysfunction in that, but there's been a revival. Oh, so a very loud horn. Sorry about that. I'll wait for the horn. I think we're dealing with an angry, uh, there we go. All right. Hopefully that won't repeat itself. Um, just going back to these natives. So they're the Kwakutl or Kwakwakwakiwak, as they like to be called today. Uh, and so they have these things called potlatches they, in the Pacific Northwest. And basically, they're like th these ancient mythological creatures. They're also like your family crest. Like if any of you have done research and you got a dragon in your family crest or something like that, it's like that. But they literally dance with those, you know, spiritual creatures that tell people, okay, you're from this family or that family. And this hairy creature um is a really a big part of most of the pacific northwest potluck ceremonies and it's a full costume with hair and everything and um there's wild man of the woods technically bokwus technically is 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 the creature there's also a female version called zunaqua and those are the ones that i saw and they act out certain things that people have reported in sasquatch sightings and they're acted out in the potlatch. You actually see it. And that, if I'm not mistaken, I guess the potlatch, because I've heard about this, it's kind of like, um, if I'm not mistaken, their legend was that those tribes, actually, when they went to war, they had the, on their shields, they had um, drawings of these uh, of these creatures on their shields. Uh, I think that's the same area that that came from. And it and the, well, another name for yeah, I mean I mean, they're basically clan, they're clan, uh, you know, symbols, right? So depending on which clan you were, it might be a frog, it might be, you know, Thunderbird's another big one, right? My friend right. Ken Gerhardt, he's written several books about Thunderbird and people have sightings. So that's another one of those creatures. Are we talking about a bald eagle, a stellar sea eagle? What is it? And in the case of, I guess it opened up for me when I was, uh, you know, not too young. I was in my 20s. And um, like, what exactly are these wild men stories? They're here in the Pacific Northwest, but they have the same ones in Russia and in China and in Romania. And uh, they all have different names, but they're the same creature. And something like the hairy man, it's, it's actually depicted in the royal coats of arms of European families. You see this full hairy man-like creature holding a club and he's standing next to the unicorn or the dragon or whatever. It's another right. <laughs> one of those creatures that's part of our, uh, what Joseph Campbell and Carl Jung, they, you know, they, they, they reference those things. It's a universal archetype. No, it makes perfect sense. So we get this, we get to this point to where both of those interests collide 
your your love for filmmaking that you've had from since you were a child to the point to where uh, your interest in cryptids and cryptozoology they collide and and you start working on TV shows like Swamp Monsters and Killing Bigfoot and your very first one in the nineties. I'm it's slipping my uh, my memory, but um, oh, Sasquatch Odyssey. Sasquatch Odyssey. How was that experience for you starting yeah. off? So take me yeah. back to the very beginning from the conceptualization of the idea. I want to know that, like, um, you're sitting at home and you decide you're going to do this. Yeah. How did you come up with those concepts, like Sasquatch Odyssey? Well, so let me tell you. So this this title, and I, and I don't, now you're asking me, and I don't like to blow my horn too much, but it really is since, uh, you know, uh, Leonard Nimoy's uh, In Search Of, there really wasn't, any new shows on Bigfoot or Sasquatch or anything. We're talking about 1998. And um, a friend of mine introduced me to a fellow named Rene de Hinden, who <clears throat> he owned half the rights to the, the photographic rights to the Patterson film, which your audience will know. It's the famous, you know, uh, 16 millimeter film footage from 1967 of the Bigfoot, you know, the archetypal shot of Bigfoot. And so Rene had the rights and he was working with Mrs. Patterson, uh, but he was up in Vancouver and he was a dude who lived, he was a Swiss guy, kind of cranky, funny as hell. And it, once I started talking to him, I realized that there were four of these old men of Bigfoot hunting, um, Rene de Hendon, John Green, um, and Peter Byrne, who was the, uh, you know, hunting the Yeti in 1956 with Tom Slick. The Texas oil man, and then there was Grover Krantz, the physical anthropologist, and all of these guys. They were actually replicated in Harry and the Hendersons. They they actually based some of those characters on them. Didn't and, know that. Um, so no one had ever done a show about these these um, four guys, the ho the four horsemen of Sasquatchery, as they were <laughs> sometimes referred to. And I just thought it would make for a really interesting show. It, as much about these men and their lifelong pursuit of the monster that not everyone believes in. No, nah, that's awesome. I didn't know that. I didn't know Harry and Henderson's was based on that. I loved that uh, as a young kid. I don't know. Well, I think I was a teenager when Harry and Henderson's well, came out. I loved I'll, that. I'll tell you, the French guy played by David Suchet, who is uh, some of you might know was also Poirot on the PBS series. And then uh, Don Amici, you know, played this uh, old uh, curiosity shop, kind of, you know, trading shop thing that John Lithgow goes into. That's John Green. And he's holding, actually holding John Green's book in that show. He, he picks that book up from the library. John Lithgow does. It was called The Apes Among Us. John Green recorded over 3,000 sightings by the 1980s. And um, and then there's, um, you know, Peter Byrne is just, he's the sort of your great white hunter. Right. And there, there's they're represented in different ways in the movie. And they're everybody knew about them back in the day, uh, but no one had ever put them all together in a movie because they argued and bickered and fought with each other about what was Bigfoot? What should we do if we cap if we get it? Should we capture it? Should we let it go? And I like the idea that these four guys were together at one point, but then they broke apart over differences on Bigfoot. So the Bigfoot community itself, so this this kind of back and forth bickering that's still in the Bigfoot community in large. It's been there since the inception, basically. That's good to know. I didn't know that. I always was like, man, why is everybody always arguing so much? But it's been that way since the beginning. That's another piece of information. Yeah. That's a gold, that's a <clears throat> yeah. gem you just dropped, like a golden nugget yeah. for real. And wow. a lot of your listeners will know Lauren Coleman. He's kind yeah. of officially the cryptozoologist. Right. And Lauren actually taught a college course based on Sasquatch Odyssey. Uh, he he taught a whole course based on because it's the history of the hunt for Bigfoot. And um, so he helped really, you know, promote it. And he talked a lot about, um, you know, he, he called it the best, the best show ever done on Bigfoot. And it's certainly the only one that was uh, about, you know, the history of the hunt for Bigfoot and putting those four guys 
together. No one, no one did that. So it was, it was fun. It actually got shortlisted uh, for the Academy Awards. It was the IDA. It's in LA uh, International Documentary Association. They picked it out of 500 films. They picked 11. And, and when they picked those 11, they put it in a theater for two weeks, which qualifies you for, for it. That means you can, you're allowed to enter it into the Oscars. And that was quite an honor. Uh, we didn't win because usually it's really serious social issue films that get picked. <laughs> but uh, it was still an honor to be in it and uh, was on that kind of level, right? And it's done it's done really well. It still sells really well and, and uh, people people like it. Well, the way I see it, you know, Sasquatch and Bigfoot content is timeless because as as the the popularity and fame of this this cryptid evolves, historically people go back and look to try and find things. So it, it that's never going anywhere in my mind because people always want to trace things back to the source. So you putting that together back then, it's not going anywhere. There's always going to be interest in it because the topic of cryptids is only getting more and more popular. It's kind of crazy where it is right now, but it's in this yeah. crazy space where it's getting more, the new cell phones and you get more <laughs> footage. It, it's just, it's insane, yeah. man. It really is. Well, well, I'm glad we're talking because at some point the broadcasters decided that people only wanted to hear about ghosts and, um, <laughs> and night vision shows about hunting ghosts and, and so they didn't support their, the last few years, they haven't been supporting uh, cryptid shows so much. And, um, you know, there's one that's out there right now. Some friends of mine are on it. Um, Sage Accord and uh, Maria. I know both of them and, and I'm glad they've got that on the air. Um, but I think there's room for more shows, you know, so um so we can talk, you know, you can ask me the questions. <laughs> I've, got a, I've, done a, I've done a lot. I've done a lot of this. I've done, I've done probably 200 films in my life and won about 80 awards and produced for all the world's broadcasters, BBC, National Geographic, Discovery, Animal Planet, History, TLC. I've worked for all of them. Well, I'll tell you, uh, just as a point of reference, so there's a guy named Tony Merkel. And this yep. is how much the interest is available out there in cryptids. Tony, good friend of mine, did his own documentary that he shot about Dog Man. And he went to the, I want to say he went to LBL. He went, forgot where Tony went. But Tony ended yep. up getting like 100,000 views on pretty much wow. a homemade documentary. So for, That's incredible. And, I, and you take this interview and you send this to people so they'll understand, to the TV producers. And they need <laughs> to understand, I'm serious, they need to understand the interest in cryptids is so far beyond what they will ever understand if they're not, they don't have their fingers in the dirt and kind of digging around in the soil. Because, for example, um, you produce TV shows. So let's say the average Bigfoot show, how many viewers would they have in a night on one episode? Is it millions? Is it hundred thousands? What is Oh, it? gosh. You know, it depends. It depends on the network, really. Um, I'm not sure what the numbers are now. Ballpark. You have to be right in the ballpark. Well, I certainly know in its in its heyday, finding Bigfoot was probably getting one to two million viewers, you know, something like that. I'm and so here's where they're missing. And here's this is what they're missing. So across the cryptid space, there's there's uh podcasters who get a million downloads per day. Um, there's YouTubers who get millions of views per 9 million, 12 million views per month. And so if, if they ignore the crypt, if the space has evolved to the point to where if they know how to tap into the right people, it, it will blow anything out of the water. But if they don't tap into the yeah. right sources, it won't blow anything out of the water. Okay. That's enough. I'm off yeah. my soapbox. Let's go into, um, some of the other stuff. Walk me through when you got to, uh, Swamp Monsters. Which one came for us first? Was it well, Swamp Monsters? Swamp Monsters or? was actually an episode of Biggest and Baddest. Okay. Um, so that... Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't not to be confused with Swamp People, uh, because I, I don't. I don't like to shoot gators. I, I, I live and let live kind of guy on the gators. On the gators I kind of shot. Done, I shot done, him, bro. <laughs> I've, done, I've done some. Hey man, I did a gator rescue. We did a gator rescue show and. My host uh, went into a hundred foot long tunnel, black tunnel, 
that there's absolutely no light and and there was a seven foot gator in there and he had to push a trash can through and there was a guy on the other side that put a rope around its tail and dragged it out it's really crazy um <laughs> especially because i could just hear i was worried about my my guy uh biologist and he's in there and all i hear it's like a radio play you can't see him but you hear like, oh my god it's coming through the bottom i'm like oh shit get out of there <laughs> <laughs> Playing with dinosaurs is what it should have been okay. called because that's what he's doing. Yeah. Playing with freaking but, dinosaurs. But anyway, I'll just tell you. So basically, I created a series called Biggest and Baddest. Two seasons have been on Nat National Geographic here. It's with a British guy named Niall McCann. Uh, he's really tough. Uh, he's, uh, like I said, he's rowed across the Atlantic Ocean in a rowboat in 60 days with a friend. Um, he's crossed the Greenland's polar ice cap twice. One time on a speed wing, that's like a hang glider type thing, parasail, paraglider. Um, yeah, skis and skis and speed speed wings. Uh, so he's a pretty hardcore guy. He's he's actually working on anti poaching teams in Africa right now, heading up those. So we we work with Niall and we caught some of the biggest anacondas ever on camera, uh, for real. Nothing set up. Uh, we went after stories like they're really conservation stories, but it's like, why are these predators? People are so afraid of them. And like, what are the predators up to? Right. Sometimes the animals we fear the most need the most help. So it was kind of that uh, it had a conservation message, but we were in your face like we would go right to where these animals are. And the most recent we did season three. I was shooting in 2019 in the Arctic and in India and in Texas. And in, in the Arctic, we worked with polar bears and we got really close to getting uh, attacked there. They, they, we had a really good guy who was watching our back, but you never know when they're going to come at you. And that story was about how the ocean basically, like the freeze up is what is way later now because of the climate change and stuff. So they're three, four months later, the polar bears are just hanging around the towns and they're, they're attacking people. And we interviewed a, a, a young woman at Halloween who was chased by a polar bear in the town and it picked her up, uh, it scalped her and then threw her around like a rag doll, like, a, like the way they kill seals trying to break its neck. Holy crap. And, she, and she survived and she's okay. And um, so we're up there right with the polar bears and we're saying, okay, how is this changing planet? How is it affecting human animal conflict? So uh, yeah, even the wildlife shows I do are, are in your face and adventurous with uh, you know, a good message. So you've been out as a director, that means you're out on set, you're, you're, you're behind camera when all the stuff is going on. On that I'm series, what was, the, what was the scariest moment for you being out there on those adventure series? Something that was like, holy crap, we might need uh, to get out of here. Well, we've had a lot of close encounters. Uh, we got charged by tigers in, in Nepal. Uh, we were with a group of um, uh, forest wardens, and the way they get around is on elephants, uh, and because there's no cars and no roads, and that's the way you get in. And uh, tiger came out of nowhere. I got it on. I got a really good shot of it. I was actually riding behind Nile. And I was shooting that and I got it. It basically appeared in the grass, looked at us and then covered a hundred yards in about five seconds um, and came right to the foot of the elephant and turned. But there was a kill site close by and, a, and maybe a yearling cub. So she was telling us to get the hell, hell out. And, um, but we've had a close, the, on the last show in 2019, we were in the woods and I've worked with elephants, forest elephants before, and they're the most dangerous. And we're telling the story how they're running out of land, they're running out of jungle. And so they're wandering through farms and communities in India and people try to stop them. And, and, and a lot of times the, it's government sanctioned. They have these flaming torches. So elephants don't like flaming torches. <laughs> and so they came, yeah, one of them charged and uh, my camera assistant, Andy actually, was for some reason trying to save our tripod and was running with the tripod and fell. And the elephant came within 20 feet of him 
and he thought he was going to get stomped on and it just stopped and trumpeted and uh, turned and left. Uh, but yeah, close encounters like that. Dude, that's way too much for me. That's that's <laughs> that's way too much for me. I, I'm not like I'm on Louisiana board, so we kill gators because it was in a neighborhood where we grew up at. And if you kill a gator, you're going to eat it. <laughs> but I'm not. Y'all, you guys are way more adventurous than I would ever be. Tigers and giant, and elephants, that's way too much for me. Uh, we had a micro uh, microchip inside a 18-foot king cobra, um, and we were following it through the forest, and they would be tracking it, but then all of a sudden they'd lose, <laughs> they'd lose track of where it was, and suddenly, like, this thing appears like a foot and a half away from my, my host's feet, and the and so this is the most venomous. There's other snakes that have more potent venom, but this has the most venom. It's the longest venomous snake in the world. It can kill 20 men or one elephant. And um, so the guide, the guides were all like, like a statue, like a statue. And we're all like frozen and this thing goes by, like it seems to take forever. Um, so we had some close calls with them and uh, they actually like to go to the roads and they rise up six feet in the air and they look each way before they cross they look each way and if they see a car or any movement they drop and they go along the ditch and they wait again and they wait they only cross when the moment's right da, so uh, that, wow <laughs> six feet in the air whoa bro that's man no there's a nine they can be 19 to 20 feet a king cobra so Dude, that's, that's giant python size but they're packing enough venom to kill an elephant that's scary that that's that's <laughs> horrific to just be to be out in the woods walking around or this is the jungle to be walking around and something rises up six feet tall ready to strike you man I, that's the stuff of nightmares all right let's move on to um some of the bigfoot stuff that you you've done how did yep. you how did you get into those bigfoot shows what was the impetus for you starting those bigfoot shows the more recent ones Sure. Uh, so I, I told you about my early days with the uh, native people, and then I did Sasquatch Odyssey. And then in, in 2000, we did a show called Monster Hunters, um, which was really the first um, crypto show on American TV that's made that was made here. Um, and it was also the first show on Discovery with Monster Anything. That was before Monster Garage. And in fact, there weren't any reality shows yet. So I was arguing <laughs> that we, we needed to let people speak and not just put narration over everything. So it was fairly unique when we did it, and it was on TLC, and we covered six creatures worldwide, uh, including Chupacabra in the days when Chupacabra was a flying, winged, alien-like creature in Puerto Rico and didn't resemble a dog in Mexico. Uh, that's it started chupacabra started in Puerto Rico uh, and then we also did the cadbosaurus which is a sea serpent in Pacific Northwest uh, we did the Australian yowie which is a Bigfoot in Australia and um, I wanted to do things that were slightly different that hadn't been done too often um, and that you know just you know snowballed like we did more shows like that and the most recent Bigfoot show I did was called Killing Bigfoot. Uh, not actually my first choice for the title, but all the networks seem to like it. Um, but so, look, there's two groups in the U.S. that have been hunting, researching Bigfoot longer than any others. One is BFRO, which is in Finding Bigfoot, and the other is the GCBRO, which is in the South. And they essentially, they've got the same level of experience, and no one had ever done a show with them. And uh, being in the South, um, the creature is supposed to be very different. It's it's leaner, it's quicker, and it's aggressive. So GCBRO has got literally like hundreds, maybe thousands of sighting reports that come into their website. And, and there are people that are genuinely terrified. So we went out with the GCBRO. Um, these guys are armed. <laughs> and... Um, but, you know, they're very, um, they're serious about this. They're not out to shoot. 
anything that moves in the woods. These guys have got backgrounds in uh, in the military, uh, ex cops, ex mountain rescue. Uh, never had an injury on set or anything like that in all the 20 plus years they've been doing it. Um, and really what they want to do is they want to scare the creature off. Um, the only killing part is they said, look, if we ever got like 100% positive critter in our sights, that we would take a specimen because science means a specimen. And they're right about that. If you look at the history of any animal, you look at all the European museums and even the Smithsonian and the Natural History Museum in New York, they're all filled with specimens. And that's because that's what science did. Um, so that's what they're saying. And it, of course, it created controversy. Um, I thought it was good for ratings, <laughs> generally. Uh, no Bigfoot were harmed in the making of the show. Um, and everyone was very careful. And it really was a look at what they do and the people that they respond to. And there's genuine concern about these animals, um, you know, taking uh, pets, you know, uh, farm animals, uh, frightening people in their homes. And that's what it was about. And I was, I was interested in it. Yes, 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 I hope you have enjoyed part of this interview. But if you want to hear the rest of this, you need to be a member at IamDogWaters.com. Yes, 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 don't be cheap. It is well worth the money to hear the top-level content that we create. I am Becoming a member today.